All right, so we're going to get started. Hello, everyone. Welcome to new member orientation. My name is Brianne Delagadi, and I have the privilege here of being the program director for the Osher Lifelong Learning Institute here at the wonderful Stony Brook University. I want to welcome all of you today to new member orientation. Just please be aware today's event will be recorded. Although the folks at home can't see you, they can see me. So if you do come up anywhere in this vicinity, you'll be included in the recording. <laughs> Um, to those of you who are joining us at home today, we're so happy to have you. Um, Ali here at Stony Brook, we're proud to have three modalities in which we offer programming in person, online, and hybrid. So while we're here on campus, I also just want to take the time to acknowledge the fact that we have a wonderful tech staff here. And if there are any technical glitches that we run into, we have a team on site. So again, thank you to the wonderful tech team here at Stony Brook. Our fall semester is going to begin on Tuesday, September 5th. So enjoy the last weekend of summer because it's back to school on Tuesday for everyone. <sighs> so today we have our wonderful pro staff with us. And I would like to take this time to kick us off and introduce you to the wonderful pro staff team. Joining us here today and coming up to the front of the room, I'd like to introduce Liz Wilson, Ollie's member relations assistant. Some of Liz's passions are cooking and baking, and sometimes she finds herself baking chocolate chip cookies at midnight, and she brings them into the office for everyone. <laughs> Next on our student team, we have David. David, come on up. David is a doctoral student in clarinet performance, and he's graduating from Stony Brook in the spring of 2024. Sucks that our slide is not advancing. And some fun facts about David is that he enjoys binge watching Harry Potter and he recently became a fan of sparkling water. He tells me he drinks three to five cans a day. <laughs> Next, I'd like to bring up Ama. Ama is an undergraduate student in biochemistry. Ama will be graduating in the spring of 2025. She's an international student who grew up in Sri Lanka and she can't watch the same movie twice. <laughs> Next, we have our newest member to the team. We have Ava, although she spells her name E-V-A, it is pronounced A-V-A. Um, Ava is a master's student in creative writing and she'll be graduating in the fall of 2024. She's fluent in not only one, but two languages and she published her own short story. Uh, without the, su the support and the hard work of this team, uh, there would be no program. So I really can't ask you guys for a bigger round of applause than for this amazing team right here. So thank you. So I want to thank you guys and have a seat. I want to kick us off today with a trivia question. And so we are the Osher Lifelong Learning Institute at Stony Brook University. So it's important for you guys to know this. So I'm going to mute us for the folks at home because I want to ask the question here in person. And I'm also going to give the folks at home a chance to answer and win a prize. So folks at home, hang tight. I'm going to mute me for just a sec and then we'll come back. To All right, folks at home, your turn. So by raising your digital hand or by raising your physical hand, can you tell me the, the type of mascot that Stony Brook University has? And Debbie S., if you want to unmute yourself, you were the first hand to go up. Seawolf. You are correct, Debbie. Debbie, you win a pennant, so be sure to stop into the Ollie Main office to pick that up. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. All right. 
we're getting some feedback. Like I said, tech glitches is part of the part of the course here. Okay, so during today's presentation um, and throughout the semester, you may have a lot of questions. Um, if at any point you have a question, we're going to ask that you hold until the end today. We will have a Q&A session. And if you have it during the semester, the best way to get your questions answered is by sending an email to spvolli at stonybrook.edu. Our amazing team that you met earlier answers our Stony Brook University Ali help desk. So any emails that you send, we typically have a response rate of 15 minutes or less. And fun fact, this past semester, we answered over a thousand email inquiries. So if you were one of the folks who sent an email in and your question was answered, it was likely answered by one of the folks in the red shirts back there. The inbox is monitored Monday through Friday from 8.30 a.m. to 5 p.m. If you have other questions, you can always find on the Stony Brook University OLLI website. Um, there are answers to most of them. Uh, this is what our website looks like. I took a snippet here. This is the direct link. You'll find things like the calendar, the cancellation document, news, anything that's upcoming. You're going to want to make sure that you're checking out this website. So it's stonybrook.edu slash OLLI. So here at Ollie, we like to keep everybody in the know. So if you have an email address, you're more than likely going to be getting emails from us if you haven't already. Um, some really cool emails that you'll get is every Friday, we send a weekly roundup. So that encompasses everything that's happening for the next week. You'll also, on the first of the month, with the exception of this month, you'll get it on the fifth for the start of the new semester, our What's Happening newsletter. So this is everything that's happened the past month. If you miss a lecture and you want to check out the recording, if you want to um, you know, see some information about an event that's coming up, it's all in the monthly newsletter. So definitely be checking your mail on Fridays and the first of every month. On our website, we have the member handbook. You've all gotten a copy in your welcome packet today. It's on the left side. It's called Ollie Member Handbook. And it has all the information you could ever need to know. Um, if there's something in there that you want to know and it's not in there, uh, by all means, just let us know. We'll make sure it gets in there. Um, reaching out to volunteer leaders is very, very important. So, you know, here on the campus, there are a lot of things that you'll come to learn. The best spots to get a bite to eat, where you can rent a library book, how do you get your parking? And so you're going to want to reach out to your volunteer leaders. Um, so there is some uh, information in the packets about reaching out to your leaders, but if anybody is a volunteer leader here today, can you just raise your hand so our new members can see? Can you give her a raise of your hand there? All right, so if you guys have any questions, these are the folks to ask. These are our volunteers. They're on our executive council. They're on our committees, councils, and boards, and we would love to see you reach out to them for some peer-to-peer -peer insight. Last but not least, if you guys want to stop into the main office, we're located in the SBS building. We use a lot of acronyms around here. So we're the Social Behavioral Sciences building. It's that building adjacent to the parking garage right across from the Hilton Hotel. Um, we are on the first floor, room S101. You'll see that big sign. We're right past the brand new snack section. If you guys have seen, we got some pretty good snacks now in SBS. Um, so make sure you check us out. And we also have our member lounge where some folks will be too. Okay, so I've had the pleasure of being the director here since July of 2019, and um, let's just say things have changed since I started. So when I first came on board, uh, we were a 100% in-person program. Um, we did not have Zoom, we did not have COVID, and we did not have to deal with some of these um, technology things that we, we do now. So we've really grown. And so over the years, we've had several events on the field, at the stadium. You can see some photos here from our most recent luau, some luncheons. So I just want to make sure you guys know that there is an ever-growing program here. We are not stagnant. We are not staying the same. We are getting bigger and better every single year. I'm very proud to say that our Ali was one of the first in the country, in the country to be up and running solely on Zoom when the pandemic hit. Within 10 days of being shut down here at the university, our program transformed from 100% in-person to fully remote. Um, 
the dedication that it took from our volunteers, our workshop leaders, our staff to put together documents on how to use Zoom. Some of us had no idea. Um, so it took a lot. And we're really proud of the fact that we're one of the, the first in the country to get this up and running and still maintain a synchronous program. So as I said earlier, we have three modalities. We have in-person, virtual, and hybrid. I hope all of you take advantage of each of those modalities. Each one offers something different. In person, you'll take note that we have workshops in the Social Behavioral Sciences Building, the Wong Center, here in the Student Activity Center, where you'll see a lot of students. Um, we've also started using space at the Bowman Center, as well as the Student Union, and we do have some off-campus offerings at the Fort Jefferson Village Center. Here on Zoom, we have folks that are using PCs, laptops, iPads, Macs, their phones, and they're taking workshops with the flexibility of being able to sit in their doctor's office while they're waiting and listen to their favorite workshop and not miss anything. So Zoom is a really great way to take advantage of some of the amazing workshops here. And for those who want a little bit of a mix of both, we have hybrid. So today's event is considered a hybrid event. It is synchronous, meaning that the folks at home are seeing everything in live real time. Uh, and you guys are all seeing it here in live in real time as well. So there's no recordings. They're not watching something after the fact. We're all participating at the same time. Um, I would like to thank today all of our supporters. Um, for the past several years, we've had thousands of dollars donated by members that help support the program and the sustainability of our resources. So uh, you'll take note that our two classrooms in the SDS building, room S102, and N119 were recently updated to be hybrid capable. That is all thanks to the generosity of our members. So making donations to our member giving account on giving day um, has really truly made a difference in the program. While we're applauding folks who support the Ali program, I would be absolutely remiss if I didn't acknowledge every single OLLI workshop leader who dedicates their time, energy, and passion to making sure that OLLI at SBU has the best workshops on the planet. If you're a workshop leader, could you please stand up? We want to give you the biggest round of applause right now. Without these folks, there would be no audio programming. So if you ever have the opportunity to have a conversation with one of these folks, they might just inspire you to become Ollie's next workshop leader. Now, this program would not be possible without many things, but university support is one of the most important. I would like to take this opportunity to acknowledge Stony Brook University and the many departments and people on this campus that make it happen. We are a tremendous success because we are on the best campus. Stony Brook University's President McGinnis and Provost Luez, the Division of Information Technology, Mobility and Parking Services, Campus Operations and Maintenance, University Police Department, who you'll get to meet in a little while, our Campus Health and Wellness and Prevention Services, Emergency Services, and the Career Center. Last, but certainly not least, I'd like to thank the folks at the School of Professional Development. I would especially like to thank Peter Diplock, Pat Malone, and Diane Perillo for the immense amount of support, guidance, and oversight that they provide to this program. Yes, round of applause. <laughs> so on that note, I would like to introduce you to SPD Senior Director for Finance, Administration, and more to Diane Perillo. Yeah, you can see it, but I'm not, so I can't move. Yeah. Oh, it's touching again. Good morning and welcome. So I have to stand right here so everyone at home can see me. I like to walk around. I even wrote notes so I would stay on point. Um, so I'd like to welcome all of you to the Osher Lifelong Learning Institute program at Stony Brook. Brianne has a slide up here that shows the intersection of circles, because this means that you're not part of just Stony Brook, you're part of a larger lifelong learning institute. There are 125 OSHER lifelong learning institutes nationally, which means other colleges and universities 
are doing this. I think we do it better because A, I'm a seawolf. So whenever you're asked a question, what's a seawolf? Your response is, I'm a seawolf. So we're gonna try that real quick. What's a seawolf? Are you? There you go. So that's the answer to what's a sea wolf. And then whenever you see Wolfie, you ask him what's a sea wolf and he'll give you a hug. <laughs> so just to give you some history to these little circles, the lifelong learning idea that the School of Professional Development has hosted is 36 years old. In 1997, this idea of lifelong learning was called the round table. Jane Cash, who I think is here today, will tell you her mom was a round table member. So obviously we are generations of Jedis and a generation of Ollie members to come and to continue. Then in 2007, the Bernard Osher Foundation, who is the foundation, the endowing agency, came to Stony Brook and said, we like your program. We want to give you money to expand the resources and availability to the population on Long Island. So in 2007, Stony Brook received a million dollars. With that million, we have to guarantee 500 or more unduplicated members. Now we're not gonna get technical and policy, but we received a million dollars to now bring 500 people to campus. So in 2016, the Bernard Osher Foundation looked at all of their ollies and said, we're gonna, gonna slow down the endowment and we're instead of expanding, we're gonna give back to our current schools that are performing really well and that we think can do better. So they've been great, but we want them to be better. So in 2016, Stony Brook was then awarded another million dollars. So now we have a $2 million endowment, which grows every year with percentage increase with earnings back to us for the program. But this means we now have the responsibility to our donor to have a thousand of you fantastic people be part of our program. So this is what we have been, we as the School of Professional Development, the OSHER office and all the volunteers, we strive to be a thousand plus. Now with COVID and coming back from COVID and all that, we're still chugging along. OSHA is not penalizing their institutions because they understand things happen, the crisis happened. But I just want you all to understand how proud OSHA has been Stony Brook by awarding the additional dollars. So future forward, 125 is the number unless Ollie's closed down, which that could happen at other colleges, Not never gonna happen here. But I just want you to understand the powerful circles that happen. Not only are you supported by Stony Brook by having resources available to you on the campus to be able to see the students, the next generation of learners who are gonna go into the workforce, be part of their learning experience. But what I think is most special about our program, <clears throat> Brianna has spoken about it, and I'm not taking anything away from the curriculum committee, but I think the peer-to-peer -peer workshop learning is what makes our program the most special because it's you have an idea or you love something, you love French and you wanna teach it to all your friends and everyone's like, I really don't know anything but the word baguette. And by the end of your 14 weeks or 10 weeks or eight weeks, you will know how to talk and say more things. And then you have a circle of friends, a new core group of people that you have an interest with. This is what I feel is our most powerful tool to you is taking your experience and then sharing it out with other people. So we have a lot of work to do because you have a lot of information we want to learn. So I'm just going to go back because I wrote my notes and then I went totally out of order. But I just want to share yesterday I went to my son's high school orientation and his principal was welcoming the freshmen and talking about orientation. And now you have a high schooler and, you know, you're you know, going to be the next couple of years getting them ready for college. But in life, you have more orientation moments. So not only are you a freshman student becoming orientated, but you are now a parent. So I thought of that and I said, huh, I'm gonna be somewhere tomorrow and we're gonna have a bunch of freshmen. So this is your freshman orientation into Ali. So no matter what lifelong learning happens, there's always some type of orientation where you can say, I am that first year student, I am now that freshman who gets to enjoy and try to figure out what life on the Stony Brook campus is. This is your moment. So I wanna ask from all of you in the room, how many of our new members, and for those of you at home, you can raise your hand or give a thumbs up. How many of you are brand new Ollie, brand new to Ollie, like never been? Wow, look at that. The majority of the room, this is great. So your job is to bring two people. And at least half of you need to become workshop leaders by next summer. That's your assignment, okay? Because we're in college, we have to talk about assignments and, and reports. 
Second, how many of you in this room and returning members, you can participate because I love to, I love knowing this data. How many of you are alumni, whether undergrad, graduate, doctorate? Great. Any returning staff or faculty? Okay. How many of you in this room were once an OLLI member, took a break, and now are coming back because you missed us? Perfect. So see, everyone has a story. And in all of these stories, all of these new members, you bring to us such rich knowledge that we cannot wait to find out how you're going to improve our program, bring new events to our pro program, and bring new workshops. So I just want to talk a little bit about what the School of Professional Development is. So we are the body on campus that offers six degree master's programs fully online to working professionals. The OSHA program is one of our programs that we administer. In addition to the six degree programs and training and teacher education, Ali is one of our units under the school. So we work with Brianne and her team and Brianne does a lot of networking on this campus and has won over people to provide for the Ali program. And I want you to understand that you have um, a great support system that tackles any kind of misnomers that might happen on campus or can explain to the campus, A, why we need these people on campus, why we need these uh, community members, and why we need to give them certain spaces in certain buildings. So just know you have a great advocacy group talking to the administration. Yes, we have students and they're wonderful and whatever, but there's more to the college experience than the credit bearing programs. And that's everything SPD lives and breathes, whether it's in person or online, that is our motto for whatever. So in the Ollie office, it really resonates the after you're done with your raising your children, working and going to school, this is the next step. You wanna come back and you wanna do social learning. So that's what we're doing today. I encourage all of you to reach out to Brienne and her team that she brought up. We have fantastic, uh, the office is a great place. The lounge is a great place. Come have a cup of coffee and just hang out and chat, kick off your shoes and just enjoy. But I also encourage you to meet your volunteer advocate leaders, their role. They're taking time out of their life to not only just be part of Ali, but to say, I want to do one better. And I want to be at, I want to have a conversation with the School of Professional Development and the Ali office about what are things we can do in the out years to keep our program from growing? How can we get more money to sustain maybe possibly reducing fees by raising money to say parking is going to be covered by the program? These are the things that the volunteers do. They're the advocates for your voice because Brianne and Liz, we love all of you, but we can't hear from all of you. So we have an extension of other people who are here to listen to you. So I encourage you not only to sign up to be a workshop leader, bring in more members, but meet your volunteer leaders and talk to them a little bit more. So I am going to thank you and welcome you all to the OSHA Life and Learning Program, and I look forward to meeting all of you in other events. All right, ooh, I get to introduce Ms. Sue Maroos. So I get to introduce Sue Maroos, who's the Executive Council President for the OSHA Life and Learning Institute. I thought I, oh, I dropped my stuff free. Sue always has a smile on her face. So I'm glad that I got to give a nice little pep talk because it's going to be greatly forward and followed up by Sue. So come on up. Thank you, Diane, Brianne. Welcome, everyone. I am so happy to see you all here. I am the new Sumaru's, the new president of our Ali Executive Council. And I do have some people that I have to thank and for working so closely with me over the past year. And that would be our past president, Ellen Nice, our past past president, Mary Hans, our, our president-elect, Ed Metzendorf, and so many of you. And you know who you are, and I thank you because this wouldn't be here. We have an incredible leadership team, as you've already seen um, here at, at Ali. And Brianne Delegati, our program director, Liz Wilson, Pat Malone, Diane Perillo, and our brand new 
Vice Provost Peter Diplock. Am I hiding something? No, no, I just didn't want to Oh, okay. <laughs> as well as all of our student volunteers and all of our volunteers. Together, we had a 15% increase in membership for the 2022-23 year, and we're looking forward to an exciting growth year ahead. The more the merrier here at Ali. I think back and remember in the early 90s, and Jane, my parents were part of the round table as well. And they, my mom took watercolor painting. My dad took every type of history class that he could, and they loved it. And let's see again, I'm going to ask you again, if this is your very first orientation, can you? Okay, thank you, thank you. My first orientation was September, just like this, of 2016. My brother, Doug Hodges, and sister-in-law, Dale, were taking Ollie courses, and they loved everything, and they were telling me everything they were doing. Of course, I couldn't resist. I was still working, so I did have a little flexibility. I was able to take some Ollie courses, workshops, and I had a wonderful time, loved it. And my brother, Gary, my other brother, Gary, who is also still working with some flexibility, has joined Ollie as well. So my parents would be very happy to see us, and uh, Ali is a member of our family for sure. In 2019, though, when I retired, as luck would have it, in February of 2020, Josie Curcio encouraged me to take membership of uh, the chairmanship of the Member Relations Committee. She wanted to be president-elect at that time. And once I became a committee chair, I loved Ali even more. I was back to socializing, making friends, new friends, learning just where I wanted to be. And I was on the executive council. So that was double the fun. Our executive council is an important part of Ali. All members of the executive council work together with our program director, Brianne Delegati, to keep our Ali mission and vision alive. The executive council is made up of two parts, the elected officers and the committee chairs. First, I'd like you to meet our elected officers. If you are here, would you please stand? Past president, Ellen Nice. President elect, Ed Metzendorf. Secretary, Linda Steffens. And we have four members at large. Carmela Gustafson, Ira Kurtzberg, Jay Zuckerman, and Tom Brownworth. Thank you, all of you. You're wonderful. Thank you. These volunteers are always there to support our committees, our workshop leaders, and any and all the projects we've got going. And then we have our committees. Our committee chairs are also on the executive council. Together with their committee members, they establish operating procedures, policies, curriculum, and program activities. We'd like you to meet our committee chairs who will tell you a little bit about what their committee does. So first, we'd like you to meet our Arts Council Chair, Bob Stone. Come on up, Bob. Good morning. Uh, the mission of the Arts Council is to further the visual and performing arts at uh, the uh, at Ali. We what we are doing right now, presently, is we have we sponsor the uh, art exhibit each semester. The visual arts we have paintings, photography. Uh, sculpture, et cetera, that we set up in room 102. And we have also the literary tea each semester, which is uh, where members can read their uh, the literature that they've created, whether it's poetry, whether it's uh, memoirs, stories, et cetera. So that goes on each semester. And uh, that's what we're doing currently. But I encourage, please, new members, 
current members, any members to come and join us, give us new ideas, new thoughts, new blood. We'd like to encourage any form of the arts. So please join us. Our first meeting is uh, next Thursday at 8.45. I believe it's a hybrid meeting, is it? It's all Zoom? Okay, well, so be it. It's a Zoom meeting. You'll see, well, you'll see us there on Thursday. Okay, uh, one thing I'd like to, to mention before we go on is that in my previous life, I taught anatomy and physiology to nursing and physical therapy students. So naturally, when I came to Ali, I got involved with watercolor and poetry. <laughs> so, so, you know, that's the way it works. But we are, uh, our groups are in the spirit of the round table where we, the, it's, there is no sage on the stage where somebody stands up and teaches. We are a group who teach each other. We're all teachers, we're all students. We read, we do art, we critique each other, we comment and we help each other. That's to me the spirit of the round table. So please join us. I don't know if I did something, but <laughs> please, please join us for the Arts Council. If you have any questions about it, see me, I'm here. I'll be circulating around or email me. It's so all, you know what the emails are. So that's my talk. Thank you. And now we want you to meet our curriculum chair team, Karen Vitella and Jane Cash. Come on up. Not everybody heard that. Our curriculum chair team, we have Karen DePaula and Jane Cash. Please fill us in on your team. Thank you. I guess I'll, I'll speak first and not fill in. No, we're, we're a team. We're a great team. So uh, I'm Karen DePaulo, and I've been a member since 2017 when I retired from teaching. A colleague of mine retired first and said, you must join Ali. She says, I am having such a great time. And so I did. Um, I want to mention, though, I'm from the Stony Brook area, and um, I have a daughter who graduated from Stony Brook. Um, I had a very close family member who was on the faculty here. And when I was home with children in the 80s, I read about the round table because I got the Stony Brook newsletters. And I thought, isn't this wonderful? A group of retired faculty who meet and share and take turns leading discussions. And I said, someday, someday, that's what I want to do. And so um, as I start my sixth year, um, I've been serving as curriculum co-chair. This is actually my third year. And Jane was so kind to join me, and she's been uh, co-chair for, for two years. We're a really busy committee. Um, I, I love it. Um, it's the workshop leaders are really, uh, we call them the lifeblood of our, our program. There's a lot of other things. I mean, we, you'll hear later, we take trips, we have all kinds of events and functions, but the workshops are what really drew me. And I'm so glad we came after Bob Stone because he put it so well. We, we really share our talents and our knowledge. Um, I've looked at the websites of many other Hollies and they're organized in different ways and many have, um, faculty leading courses and so on. We have a lot of retired faculty in our membership, but the point is here, all of our workshop leaders are members. So, well, for instance, take myself, I was a, an elementary reading teacher. 
I started off leading a class with a, uh, uh, another Ali member on uh, a book that I thought was very important. Um, Isabel Wilkerson's cast. Um, then I led a workshop on um, Alfred Hitchcock Presents. Uh, Jane and I, with others, led uh, two semesters worth of workshops on the 1619 Project, which you may have been familiar with from the New York Times, Nicole Hannah-Jones. If you want to know more about it, ask us. <laughs> Uh, so, I just want to tell you the curriculum committees, we are very busy, we oversee <clears throat> the proposal and approval of new workshops, uh, we encourage all of our members to become workshop leaders, so you new members, you have a little bit of time to get your feet wet, and then we're going to be approaching you and saying, what hobbies do you have, what interests, what can you share with us? We recommend guest speakers, and if you know of someone who you think would be um, a, an interesting person to present a, a talk to, to Ali, let us know. Uh, we have been working on special projects this year, a new workshop leader handbook and other things. So we are a busy commi a committee, and I do, if you are interested in curriculum, if you are interested in joining our committee, it's, it's open to all. So, um, I just want to welcome you, and um, I, I hope to meet all of you as, as this semester um, continues. Thank you. Can you see me over there? <laughs> I, I need a, a, one of those stools that you, uh, anyway. Um, okay, here we are. Uh, uh, Diane mentioned that my mother was a member of the uh, round table, and actually my daughter is also a member of Ali. So we're three generations. I think she may be watching now from home. Uh, uh, I joined when um, Ali was Zoom only. And the reason I joined is my daughter, I, I should out her, she turned 55 and she wanted to retire from a very fruitful life of teaching, but she didn't want to retire before her mother. So at 79, I retired. And uh, <laughs> and actually for me, Ollie was a great savior because um, I don't know what I would have done with myself. Uh, so I really enjoy it. It's wonderful. Uh, I, I I just find it so stimulating. I was at a, we had a tech um, training uh, just last Saturday and it was wonderful. Unfortunately, there were more young freshman uh, students there than there were Ali members. But these young people, they're so exciting. They're so brilliant. And they're all shapes, sizes, colors, uh, backgrounds. It's It's a beautiful thing. And anyway, uh, I, I really enjoyed the tech thing. And the more we have to do with the 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 uh, the university, the better it is. Um, let's see. I never taught in my life. I was a nurse and social worker. I am a graduate master's degree in social work from Stony Brook. And my granddaughter just graduated from Stony Brook with her masters. So she was class of 70, I was class of 75 and she was class of 2022. Anyway, um, so that's my life's story. <laughs> anyway, and I am a member of uh, the poetry group, uh, uh, Bob Stone's group. I love it. It's a small group and we uh, have, we make up poems and we, criticize each other in very beautiful, helpful terms. It's just just a terrific thing. All right, I have one more thing that I wanna say, chewing your ear off. This last semester, a group of us from the curriculum committee and then the uh, board uh, developed a diversity, equity, and inclusion statement. The entire statement is in, in the material that you have received. It's very important at these times when um, diversity is under fire uh, that we 
make a clear statement to the members and to the workshop leaders that we have a commitment to make everyone feel comfortable and welcome in our program. So I'm just going to read the last the last um, five uh, whatevers. Okay. One, I will not encroach on the rights of others, either as individuals or as groups. I accept the obligation to listen to and understand the beliefs and opinions of others and to treat others fairly. Three, I am accountable for my own behavior. I accept that I am in part responsible for the welfare of the Ali community itself. Four, I will stand up for the dignity of every member of this community. Five, I will celebrate and express pride in our community's diversity in all its forms, race, gender identity, differing ability, religion, sexual orientation, or any of the dimensions that make each person uniquely human. Um, uh, we were helped, we, I was helped greatly in that by uh, Al Jordan, who was a, a retired member of the faculty. Uh, and um, it's very important that we respect each other. Sometimes things get hot and heavy, in, especially when we're talking about current events and all that kind of thing. But we need to uh, respect each other and uh, make Ali a place where people can learn in comfort and acceptance. So that's my speech. <laughs> Thank you, Karen and Jane, Curriculum Committee. And now we'd like you to meet our member relations chair, and that is Bob Merman. I'm like Diane. I I hate to be self-contained like this. Uh, half my speech is up there, so if you can read that. Uh, I don't. I don't need to. Um, but we do need members for the membership committee. As of right now, I just took over, uh, not necessarily by choice, but I've been a member of Ali since 2012, and somehow I got sucked in very early in the program. In fact, do me a favor. All the new members stand up for a second. The old guys, you, you, you've heard this spiel. Okay, look to your left, look to your right. One of you within a few years is gonna be president of Ali. Now, if you remember, there was a movie where John Houseman, if you remember him, won the Supporting Actor uh, Academy Award. And he was in the movie called The Paper Chase, and then it was on TV for four years. And this wasn't necessarily verbatim, the exact quote, but it was something to the effect, look to the left, look to the right. One of you will not be here for graduation. That was in law school. Now, I'm hoping that everybody that stood up will be here as a member a few years from now. But I, I became a member in 2012, so I'm starting my 12th year. I retired in April of 12. Um, I have a client in the room here from years ago who said, I kept saying to her, what am I going to do when I retire? She doesn't have to stand up if she'll, I'll embarrass, I'll emb I'll embarrass her, but she's smiling over there. Um, and she said, you have to join Ali. I didn't know what the hell an Ali was, you know, other than uh, Ali from Kukla Fran and Ali. Okay. But uh, the bottom line was, she encouraged me and, and a friend of mine's wife was a member and uh, myself and two other guys joined. That was in 2012. And I got in a very close friend who's not here unless he's on Zoom today, um, was teaching a workshop. We became very, very close. And he got me into, originally I was on the membership committee, a fundraising committee. I'm a joiner. That doesn't mean you have to be, but we would certainly appreciate that. Um, in 2017, I was president, and I'm still here, even after that. And we had a number of issues. Every president goes through issues. But we have so many wonderful people here. Um, I mentioned, uh, uh, Karen mentioned, 
that she did a Hitchcock workshop. Now, if it wasn't for Karen doing a Hitchcock workshop on Zoom, I wouldn't be with my buddy over there, Jay Zuckerman, doing a Twilight Zone workshop for the last two years. Because I thought, wow, Hitchcock was such a great show. I love Twilight Zone. And it's going to be going on forever because we have 156 episodes. Okay. Um, the, the other quick thing is um, I took over the membership committee because a, a couple of good friends of mine, gals, understand where I'm going with this. Okay. Uh, said someone had had to resign for different reasons. So I took over the membership puny. As of now, that membership committee is me and a bunch of ladies. So I'm encouraging a few of the guys in the room to help me out. But in all seriousness, I know most of the gals and it'll be a very strong committee. Um, we have another committee, which is, I wouldn't call it a subcommittee, but that, that Sue had started, Growth, What's the full title? Building, building, membership. building membership. You know, just like we need volunteers, okay, for different positions, even if you're just on a committee, we need workshop leaders, okay? This is the most phenomenal program in the world because when I joined, I said to myself, how many crossroad puzzles and jumbles can I do? You could do just so many, but please look around. Talk to the people who are members that have been here for a while. Talk to the volunteers like myself and really think very, very hard about how strong this program is and how much stronger it can be. Thank you. And now our travel and leisure chair, Bunny Avro. Bunny. <laughs> there you go, buddy. Good morning. As Sue said, my name is Bunny Avril, 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 whatever suits you. I retired in 2005, and I had to fill my days with something meaningful. I joined Ollie in 2006. After being there for, I guess, a, a year, I decided that it was such a fabulous program that in some way I had to give back. I always feel that you can't take without giving back. So I said, okay, I'm gonna join a committee. Now, I love to travel. I love museums. I love theater. I love history. I love architecture. So it seemed to me that the Travel and Leisure Committee, at that time it was called Special Events, seemed to be a very natural fit. It's such a natural fit that I've been fitting into it for the last 12 years. Anyway, this year we've planned a lot of exciting things and we're exploring all new types of venues and ideas. And that's why we need new blood to help us with the new ideas. We have a lot of old ideas. We try to keep coming up with new ideas, but it's from you that we'll get the new ideas. This year, some of the things that we're planning on doing is we're gonna go to the Met and we're gonna try to get, uh, <clears throat> see the uh, Degas MNA exhibit plus everything else that the Met has to offer. Uh, in November, we're trying to go to Grand Central Station for a tour there. And they also have the uh, crafts market there in the November and December. And across the street, there is a new building that's supposedly very exciting and a hot place to go in New York City called the Summit, which is a configuration of rooms with mirrors and art and whatever. Uh, we also found out that Natural Museum of History uh, has a new area called the Gilder Center, which is like an amorphic type of space that is architecturally absolutely fabulous. And of course, the museum is always a wonder. 
Uh, we're going to take advantage of the jazz loft, which is right in our community. And we are exploring a food tour of New York City. And uh, in either late spring or early summer, we're going to go <clears throat> on a walking tour of the Upper West Side. And we're going to join that with a uh, trip to backstage at the Met. So we have a lot of things planned. We try to run the gamut between history and art and architecture, science. Uh, but we want you to help us think of new things. And that's why I'd love you to be on the committee. And one thing I want you to reaffirm is that you don't have to have taught in order to be a workshop leader. Some of our wonderful workshops are taught by people that are totally out of their fields. We have dentists teaching about World War II. We have lawyers teaching about film. We have Bob and Jay teaching about a TV program. Whatever you're interested in, there is nothing more exciting than learning more about it and then imparting what you've learned. So whether it be to be part of a committee, to be a active member on the board or to teach, we need you. So please don't shy away. Thank you. <laughs> you just heard some ways to get involved and there are so many different ways to get involved in Ali. We have a marketing team, Ali Times Magazine, we have luncheons, so many ways to volunteer when you choose. And meetings, all meetings are open to everyone. So think about which ones you'd like to participate in. Each committee meets once a month and you don't have to register. You don't, you can just visit a meeting that you, that sounds interesting to you. So have fun with that. Every, every, and then every month we have, almost every month, we have a general membership meeting and every single person is invited to that. And we hope that you all come. Our next general membership meeting is going to be a party. We're having a pizza party, a birthday celebration for September and October birthdays. So you don't want to miss it. And the cake is for everyone. It doesn't have to be your birthday, but it's special when it's yours. And um, it's next Wednesday at 1.45, and we look forward to seeing every single one of you. Check your emails, as Brianne said before, check your emails every day. The newsletter and the roundup keep us up on all the Ali happenings. And then we have our workshop leaders. Workshop leaders, stand up one more time because we just wanna give you one more thank you. They're volunteers as well, and use their life's work and experience to benefit us. Thank you. We have 70 workshops right now on the roster. No matter what your interests are, we have something for you. Now, the other thing, the last thing I wanna tell you is that we don't want you to, we want you to take advantage of everything we have to offer. We have so many beautiful ways to spend your time here at Bali. And we invite you to, I invite you, if you have any questions or ideas that you'd like to share, please reach out to me because I'd love to hear from you. I wanna thank you once again for being here today. We look forward to seeing you at workshops, social events, and all about campus. And I wanna thank you again. Thank you for today. And now it's time for you to meet Liz Wilson. Liz works with all of us. She's a great friend and a great help. Liz knows what's happening, when it's happening, how it's happening. And together with Brianne, she makes it happen. And now your best assistant ever, Liz Wilson. Hi everyone. I'm only here for a quick second and I'll be back after we have the next presentation. I wanna introduce the Stony Brook University uh, police officers Jared and Joe, if you want to come up, they're going to give a presentation on safety on the campus. 
Officer Pete is usually here as well, but um, you'll probably meet him at another later date. All the, these three officers have been wonderful for the program in keeping us safe, giving us the information we need. But also this past uh, summer, they did a CPR training for everyone and they did a Stop the Bleed program, which was excellent. We're gonna try to offer it again, either in the fall or the spring, but it was, it was very informative, but very engaging and a lot of fun, believe it or not. So without further ado, Jared and Joe, it's on you. Hi, good morning, everyone. My name is Joe. This is Jared. Hello. Pete is not here, so we don't worry about him. All right. So uh, there's actually a police department here at the university. We have our own police department. We're here 24 hours a day, seven days a week. Uh, many of you, uh, of you probably saw us around. I see some familiar faces. Uh, but anyway, we're a sworn law enforcement agency, uh, just like Suffolk, Nassau, NYPD. We're pretty much all the same. We get the same training. We're all police officers through New York State. We have uniform members, uh, we have a command staff, we have detectives, we have supervisors, pretty much just like any other police department in Suffolk County or anywhere else. Uh, we also are graduates of Nassau or Suffolk Police Academies, and our department is accredited through New York State, which just means that we're held to a higher level of standards than other police departments that are not accredited. So we're we'll talking about SB Alert. If there's an emergency on campus, how do we get in touch with you? We use the SB Alert system. Everyone here has signed up for SB Alert using their campus email. So if there's an emergency, let's say there's a fire somewhere on campus, we want you to steer clear of that area. But if there's an active shooter here on campus, how do we notify you of what's going on? We use this SB Alert system, which is just us sending you uh, to your phone a text message, a voicemail, or an email, again, telling you what's going on and what you need to do. We have campus-wide LCD panels, just big screen TVs all over campus and all dormitories and all academic buildings. Our department can take over those TVs and post messages on them for you, telling you what's going on and what you need to do. The voice-capable fire alarm system, our police dispatcher can speak to you through the fire alarm system. So if we send you that initial SB alert and you're not next to your phone and don't get it, that's okay. So it can tell you, again, what's going on on campus and what you need to do in that situation using our fire alarm system. Our department is all over social media, but we don't have that many friends or followers. I'm not quite sure why. <laughs> but if you do happen to be on social media, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, please like us, follow us, because we need more friends. <laughs> all right, so we also have an SB Guardian system. This is a blue light phone in your pocket. That's what we call it. We used to have a blue light phone system on campus. We took those out, and now we have this app. It's a free app if you have an iPhone or an Android phone. It's in your app store under the title Rave Guardian, R-A-V-E Guardian. It's a free download. And how the system works is, let's say you're out of class uh, late one night, you're walking to your car, someone's following you, you get a bit nervous. You reach for your phone to call up, but you don't have our number in your phone. That's okay, you have this app. Open up the app and then press the emergency button on that app. Once you press that emergency button, that phone call will go into our police dispatcher. On our police dispatcher to the screen pops up a profile page that you'll be prompted to make. So you'll put your picture there, your class schedule, any information that you'd like the police to know if they're coming to your aid. So your your screen pops up. The app is also GPS enabled, so a map of campus pops up as well. And now you become a blinking blue dot in the map of campus, so we know exactly where you are. We assume you're in trouble because you press that button. Our dispatcher dispatches all police officers that blinking blue dot, which is you, to help you out in an emergency. This is what that profile page looks like. Again, your picture, description, class schedule, again, anything you would like us to know if we're responding to an emergency involving you. So how to contact UPD during an emergency? From a campus phone, that's any phone that's mounted to a wall, at a desk, in an office, you can dial 333 or 911. That will go directly to our police dispatcher. From your cell phone, very important to put this number in your phone, very important. You must dial 631-632-3333. That is the phone number that you're going to call to reach us. If you dial 911 from your phone, it's not going to go to us. It's going to go to the Suffolk County Police Department, okay? They're going to find that you belong here and then transfer your phone call to us. So in a true emergency, there's a bit of a delay. You're going to want to call this number right away. Again, the number is 631-632-3333. That's for any police emergency, 
fire emergency, or medical emergency. That one number does it all. All right, crimes of opportunity. We like to uh, talk about crimes of opportunity. Yeah, yeah. Let, me, let me get on Zoom. Hold on. Screen. I'm not used to this uh, technology here. All right, so I don't see me. All right, so crimes of <laughs> crimes of opportunity. We like to make sure everyone is aware of being careful to lock your items. If you have a car on campus, if you have an office on campus, if you leave your pocketbook wallet on campus, please safeguard those items. All right, lock your car doors. Lock your office doors and always lock up your personal belongings. All right. It's a safe environment, but we always like to make sure when I was just always monitor your items and lock them up if you can. Be aware of your surroundings. All right. So, a quickly transition into um, an after shooter event, what to do in the after shooter event. We're going to show a quick video. Um, the video takes place here on campus in a dormitory involving college students. So it's called run high fight. So those are your three options in the event of an active shooter before the police actually arrive to help you out. Your options are to run high fight. So again, we'll go to the video um, and then we'll discuss run high fight further. Stony Brook University is serious about providing a safe environment and ensuring that residents know how to react during an emergency. This video stages an active shooter scenario and will show actors in different situations. Always remember, in times of danger, follow your instincts and get to safety as soon as possible. Remember to call the University Police immediately at 631-632-3333 from a mobile phone or by dialing 333 from any campus landline. During an active shooter situation, your survival may depend on the actions you take in the first few moments of the event. Your safety is your top priority. Assess the situation. Know your escape routes. If you can run, run. And if possible, get others to leave with you. When you feel safe, discourage others from entering the area. When calling the university police, provide as much information as you can. The shooter's location, a description of the shooter, and the direction of flight. This morning, Red Sweatshirt, he's headed to the second floor. If you cannot run, hide. Remember to silence your phones, turn off the lights, and keep quiet. If you have SB Guardian on your mobile phone, activate it. Use whatever you can to block the door, like furniture or a doorstop. Wrap a belt around the top hinge of the door or the handle to keep it from opening. Do whatever you can to prevent the shooter from entering into the room you're in. Prepare to fight if necessary. Commit to your actions. When fighting, fight aggressively. Improvise weapons, throw objects, and yell. The focus of police will be to neutralize the threat. Police will advance past injured persons. Police, let me see your hands. When police people, arrive, people, do not get in their way. Keep hands visible at all times. Know that help for the injured is on the way. Remember, run, hide, fight. Call University Police at 333 from a landline or dial 631-632-3333 from a mobile phone if you see any suspicious activity. Your actions in the first few moments of such an event can save your life and the lives of others. Okay, so run, hide, fight. Again, those are your three options before the police arrive to the scene um, to help you out. Uh, our response time to any emergency here on campus is approximately two minutes. If you lock your keys in your car, 
I think about 20 minutes left to get to that. But an emergency, it's an emergency, I've got, I've got two minutes. So we'll go over a run. So this is your first and best option. If you're able to run, run, all right? Get out of that active shooting view, okay? Evacuate if there is an accessible escape path. So if your class takes place on the first level of a building and you hear shots fired on the second level of a building, you most likely run out of the building, right? You have an accessible escape path. Conversely, if your class is on the second floor of a building and you're shot fired on the first floor, you're more likely to hide instead of run. If you run downstairs, you might come face to face with that, that person who's doing the shooting. So only if you have an accessible escape path, uh, it's advised to run. Leave your belongings behind, your bags, your jackets, uh, your computers, your laptops with you. Leave that stuff behind. Get yourself out to safety. That stuff can be replaced and you can't be replaced. Okay, that's what's going to drag you down. Okay? So help others escape if possible. You're sitting with a friend, and you're shot by, you say, oh, you're up, let's go. Your friend says, no, I'm going to finish my thing. That's what I do. <laughs> you can leave that friend behind. Okay? You're only responsible for yourself in a situation. You can coax them for a second or two, but if that person wants to stay, you can let them stay to get yourself out to safety. Prevent individuals from entering the area where the shooter may be. That's just you being a nice person and as you're exiting the building and someone's coming to the building, so you don't want to go in there and with something going on. Keep your hands visible at all times. We've all seen police movies, police TV shows, when the police show up, they say, show me your hand, show me your hand. We say that because we want to make sure there's nothing in your hand that's going to hurt us at that moment. So always keep your hands visible. Always uh, make sure that we can see them. Follow the instructions of the police officers. We're going to be nervous coming in. You're going to be nervous running out. So if we ask you or try to command you, just try and be cognizant of that and do what we say. And do not attempt to move with the people. Just get yourself out of safety. Moving with the people is going to be our job when we get there. Okay, so just get yourself quickly out of safety. That's run. Next is should be hide. Yeah. Alright, the second next option is to hide. So if you can't run, you may have to hide. When you're hiding, you want to be quiet, you want to keep your composure. If you enter a room to hide, you want to make sure you turn the lights off if you can, lock the doors, shut the blinds if there's blinds, turn off your TVs if there's a TV in there, and always keep your phone on silent, okay, or vibrate, and keep it in your pocket. All right, we want to make sure there's no noise that the shooter can hear from the hallway. All right, so you're going to try to be quiet. You also want to make sure that if you can, you want to try to help yourselves by barricading the door. Okay, you want to barricade the door so you don't you don't make it easy for that shooter to enter. Regardless of the door opens in or out, you want to put some kind of furniture or some kind of objects in front of the door to buy you time, right? Because you want to be safe, you want to hide, and you want to make sure no one comes in. By putting furniture in front of the door, you may deter that person, that shooter, from entering your space. The smallest thing you do can help you in this situation. So the, the shooter has a one-track mind. He knows he has a time limit to get done what he has to do or she has to do. They may not want to enter a room where they have to work to, to enter. All right, so you want to make it easier on yourself if you can. Put furniture in front of the door. This way that shooter may not come in, maybe deterred from coming in, or at least make him work or her work to come into the room. All right, so hide is your second option. And your third option is going to be to fight. All right, this is your third option. And this is probably the situation you don't want to be in. Uh, this is you against someone with a weapon. All right, so you're gonna have to find something in the room to help you or to help you defend yourself against someone with a weapon. All right, chances are this person may have a gun. Um, so you need to find something in the room that's gonna help you defend yourself. Or may, maybe uh, this camera stand, uh, a chair, whatever it may be, you wanna survive for the next day. This person has a gun. In most cases, you have nothing. So whatever it takes for you to defend yourself, you're gonna do. You're gonna try to find something in the room to help you. All right, that's your third option is to, to fight. Jared went over real quick. Our phone number is 631-632-3333 from the cell phone. And the campus phone is either 911 or 333. Uh, some equipment we carry in our police cars. So to enter an active shooter scene, uh, this equipment that you see up on the screen is most likely what we're going to use to, to enter. We have the Kevlar helmet, which is a helmet we put on our head. It has a um, ballistic rating where it will protect our head from handgun rounds, all right? So we'll put that on. We have the AR-15, which is the long guns that you usually see on TV. 
Um, we have that as well. That's in each car. We have a heavy ballistic external vest. So as you see, Jared has a bulletproof vest on. There's another vest that actually goes over that. So we have the double vest. Uh, we also have a shield, as you saw in the video. And also we train with uh, all the agencies in Suffolk County, uh, some in Nassau County, all the police agencies train together when it comes to active shooter. This way, if they respond with us, we're all on the same page and we all know what we're gonna do. All right, always be prepared. Uh, we like to stress this to the students. Uh, when you're on campus, even if you're off campus, if you're in the Smith Haven Mall, if you're on campus, know where your exits are. When you enter the SAC, if you spend time in this building, you should know where the exits are, all right? If you come in one way, try using a different door. One, one day you may have to use it. Uh, cell phone reception. The buildings that you spend time in, how good is the cell phone reception? If you're in the basement, can you make a phone call if you had to? Is the cell phone reception good in the basements? Sometimes they're not. Where is your closest landline if you had to call the police if you couldn't use your cell phone? All right, so just get familiar with your surroundings. If you eat lunch in a certain area, if you have your classes in a certain area, if you spend time in a certain building, just be familiar with the building. Know your fire alarms, where they are. Uh, we have AEDs on campus. Many different things you should be familiar with if you can. And also, where can you hide? If you had to hide in a certain building, where could you hide? Just look around briefly, see what you can do. We're doing videos? That's good. Okay. All right, we're going to show you a quick video on campus in the police department. We have a emergency operations center, and basically uh, that room has control of all the cameras on campus, all your swipe card access. Uh, you can monitor the campus buses and monitors the weather. It pretty much does everything. We're going to show you a quick video of how that room actually works. In the operating emergency operating unit here at Stony Brook University, and the reason we're inside is to show you they have an enormous operation going on. This area here is about three months old, and the main purpose is to notify the students in campus of any kind of hazard, one being Juno. So you see you got the weather channel up there, and then we've got all of these, you know, different cameras throughout the campus. And here is a satellite image of what the campus looks like. This is really big doings, and we have all these seats are empty now. It's also uh, manned 24 hours a day, seven days a week. We've got Jason back there. Hi, Jason. He's in the overnight shift. But at the peak of this storm, there were about, what, 15 people here overnight. The peak right. was a Tuesday morning, um, about three o'clock in the morning. This is the assistant chief and uh, Larry Zacharisi. And uh, so tell me, what's the importance of having this, especially for a storm? Well, the ability for us with a, a campus of this size and a, a, you know, a standing population of around 11,000 residential students, we have to be able to monitor all the systems that we have. Everything from building management systems to our cameras and all the things that you see here, all the floor plans we have. This three-dimensional model really allows us to have actionable intelligence, real, you know, live, common operating picture type of decisions for us to know what's happening in this red And you know what, the, the height of the storm, you said about 1,800 students were without power, about, what was it? An, an hour and 12 minutes. An hour and 12 minutes, and you were able to see that on your system here. That's right. Uh, prior to implementing the system, we really would have had to look at a few disparate systems, but having it all together in one common view, we can see fire alarms, we can see cameras, we can see network uh, switches and activity and electrical power and know well in advance of what's happening. And this is just at Stony Brook University. And they, of course, talk with the National Weather Service, like you said, and you are constantly monitoring everything here. So this is what they have here just for the university. Classes have been canceled all up until the afternoon today, and then it's business as usual. Guys, back to you. All right, so we have that just for the university, and this is actually one of the biggest emergency operations centers in the Tri-State area next to NYPDs. We're also going to show you how the camera system in the, in the building as well, and Jared will kind of touch on that. This is one of the other functions of this emergency operating center. We can zoom into anywhere on campus and pull apart any building and show all the floor plans. So that was the Health Science Center. That's the University Hospital across the way. We're going to zoom into the Melville Library here on campus and show you the floor plan for the first floor. And those little blue dots are our swipe card system. Swipe into a door, to a room. You'll see some orange yellow cones for a second. There we go. And that's our live feed cameras. We have about 3,000 cameras here on campus. Uh, so if you are picking your nose, we can see it. So. <laughs> we, we basically show you these uh, videos because if you're on campus and say someone steals your laptop, someone takes your pocketbook, whatever it is, someone takes your car keys, your cell phone, 
but these cameras actually record and they save over a certain period of time. And also we have the ability to pull up the live feed cameras. So if you walk into a room and notice your laptop went missing a minute before, you could call us, give us a good description if you can, maybe a license plate, whatever the case is. We could pull up the cameras and track the person through the swipe pod system and through the cameras as well. So it's a pretty good system. Our detectives uh, are pretty productive with this um, setup they have. So like I said, if you have something that happened to you, even in the past, we could pull up the cameras from the past and actually view what would happen. You know, say someone took a laptop from the library and you were there, you could call us up and say on Tuesday at three o'clock, I was there. And I went back in the room at four o'clock and my computer was gone. They could actually go back and look at that stuff. Let's see here. Does anyone have any questions for us? Yes. Yeah, that's fine. I mean, anywhere you go. Oh, the question was if you have a handicap permit for your car and you cannot find the handicap parking space, can you park in a regular space? It's a very tricky question. Basically, you probably can. Uh, I'm, I'm just going to say we're not the parking department. They have their own set of rules. I really shouldn't talk for them. But if you cannot find a, a parking spot with your handicap permit, I would park somewhere else. Now, most of the lots are zoned for certain groups. So there might be a student lot, there might be a faculty lot, there might be a commuter lot. Chances are you're not going to get a ticket. If you happen to get a ticket, you could just appeal it and say, I have a handicap permit. I couldn't find a spot. And I'm sure they'll dismiss it. I wouldn't worry about that. Yeah. Yes, sir. This may be a stupid question. There's no stupid question, sorry. <laughs> if you have a situation where you have, you have a situation where you have to respond, how many offices would normally respond? And then I'm going to ask the second part. Well, it depends on the, on the call. Uh, we have about eight. Oh, sorry. Uh, if we had an emergency on campus and this gentleman called the police, how many offices would respond? It all depends. If it's an in progress, call, like if it's a burglary in progress, a fight in progress, an active shooter situation, there's going to be a lot of police officers responding, all of them. The, re the reason I ask that, what if you had a situation where you have some real wise person, that's the right word, who's wearing a police uniform? Right. There's only one person versus, let's right. say, six, six police officers on campus, and I and maybe I couldn't distinguish the uniform. Right. I would assume you run from it with one guy. Right. So the question is, if someone approaches him in a police uniform and he's not sure if he's a police officer, what should he do? I would call the 631-632-333 number, and they will verify if that person is a police officer because they know all the cops are on campus at all times. So you can say, I have an officer here. He has, he has no name on his uniform. He has a certain name on his uniform. I'm in the SPS building. Uh, is this a real police officer? They will tell you right away. All right. So that's if you ever get pulled over by someone or approached by someone in a uniform and you're not sure if they're a cop, you can always call any dispatcher if it's Suffolk County, if it's here, and they'll verify if that person's a real officer or not. Thank you. You're welcome. Yeah. All the police officers uh, drive around in campus vehicles? Uh, the question is do all police officers on campus drive around in vehicles? Some are on foot. Some are in vehicles, some are on bike. All right, so uh, majority are on car, driving car. But we have offices on foot and on bike as well. Okay. There are about eight to 10 officers on per shift, which is a lot for a small area. Because if you think about Suffolk County, there's only one police officer assigned to Stony Brook or Setorkin. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, you know, someone will come and back them up, but they may be 10, 15 minutes away. We have a lot of people in the small area. There's about 60,000 people a day on campus between this side of campus and the hospital side. So when you put 60,000 people in a three mile radius, that's a lot That's a lot of people, it's like a small city. So we, have, we do have a lot of police officers concentrated in, in, in this area. Anything else? Yes. Uh, how, how do I you know you're gonna have a question? <laughs> she, don't, she, don't, she doesn't need the mic, trust me. <laughs> I do this, uh, I've done this a couple of times to diagnose, you know, with um, yeah. I just want to thank you oh, right. personally, and I, I'm sure most people, not everyone in the room wants to thank you and your, you know, organization. 
because it's very easy to take it for granted. It's very easy to forget that you may have those those vests on, but that that's just not necessarily safe at all. Yeah. Um, and you guys come here, they do the CPR presentation. That's so outstanding. I encourage anybody in the room, new member of God, go to that presentation. I feel like I could actually take care of somebody if something happens. If, and we also have a lot of fun. Yeah. So thank you. Thank you very much. Yeah, thank you very we much. Appreciate thank it. You. Thank so, you. Thank you, guys. Thank you. Thank you very much. We'll, we'll give it a $25 after all. <laughs> yes. I think people should be aware that the university has its own ambulance service, and they're very capable and dedicated and well trained. They can be used to yeah. your number. Right? right. So she's uh, mentioning the uh, Speedback, which is the Stony Brook Volunteer Ambulance Corps. Uh, so basically, Stony Brook University has its own ambulance. All right. So any medical emergencies on campus, you'll get the Stony Brook Volunteer Ambulance. We have our own police department, which we've been talking about. And we also have our own fire marshals. All right. So we pretty much have our own capabilities here when it comes to all three services. So police, fire, medical, we have it here. Plus, we have the hospital on campus, obviously. So we're pretty self-sufficient. And uh, the ambulance crew is great. They're just, you know, same as any other ambulance crew in Long Island. They're Trained the same, they're EMTs, they're certified, uh, fire marshals same, and police the same. So we all get the same training as any other agencies that are off campus. In fact, we probably get more training because we're a smaller uh, group of people. So everyone here is definitely uh, capable of handling any kind of emergencies on, on this campus. Any other questions? All right, well, thank you very much. We appreciate it. Good luck. And I want to thank them again, uh, officers, Je Joe and Jared. Thanks again for everything. So I'm back. <laughs> again, I'm Liz Wilson with the uh, in the office, work with Brianne and the students. Uh, just a little background, real quick, because I don't want to, I don't want the program to go over. Uh, I'm from this area. I've been with Holly for three and a half years although it feels a little longer after COVID. <laughs> um, I'm from this area, so I grew up. I know a lot of the you know, uh, local establishments. I went to the Three Village School District. I have a daughter that's 19 and a dog named Sasha. And my passion is food. Not only do I like to bake and cook, I also like to eat. So if you have any questions about food, I'm happy to engage. So speaking of food, we're gonna talk about where to eat on campus and where to take your workshops. So as far as taking workshops on campus, if you're going to be on campus for your in-person workshops and you might have a break or you're in between workshops and you don't know what to do besides eating, you might wanna take a, a uh, Zoom class. You might wanna join one of your Zoom workshops on campus. So there's many, many places that you can do that. We just encourage you to bring headphones or earbuds to you know, for courtesy for others around you. Um, I'll just mention a few. The Melville Library is has a few different floors and different areas. Um, these are quiet areas and lounges, so you're more than welcome to go to the library. The Student Union is a beautiful new building. They have a couple of lounges there. And the Wong Center, which is across from the administration parking garage. There's a lot of open tables and seating. There's also food over there. So we encourage you to uh, bring your laptop, your device, your um, iPad or your phone or whatever you want to use, whatever device you want to use to take workshops while you're here on campus. So you can make a whole day of it if you have one or two workshops and you'd like to zoom into another workshop, uh, feel free. Um, as far as food establishments, we have quite a variety. Uh, I'll just mention a few that are close by that you may um, want to walk to, they're not too far. Eastside Dining, which is next to the Student Union. It's one of the newer um, the newer uh, food establishments and they have a variety of different types of food. Um, they have pizza, they have halal, they have Korean, Indian, Caribbean. They change their menu quite a bit. Uh, Wong Center has a restaurant called Jasmine and they have sushi and Indian food and um, Asian, a lot of Asian food there. Uh, and then the other one is the SAC building, which is here. This is the SAC building, Student Activity Center. 
And I know there's a new Dunkin' Donuts here, but they also have salads and other things, you know, like a, like kind of like a, um, not a food court, but like a, somewhat like a cafeteria, but they have some good healthy options as well. There is a Starbucks on campus. Um, it moved, I think it's in the East Side Dining, but there's a few others um, around the campus. So, so there's quite a few um, different food, food establishments that while you're here on campus, you might as well take advantage. And then there's, Brianne mentioned the, uh, the social behavioral sciences building. We have some, um, some vending machines where you can get snacks and things like that. So I'm gonna move on, let's see. Your schedules. So by now you should have received your personal schedules with results from the lottery if you chose in-person workshops. Tomorrow, Friday the 1st, you'll receive your fall, you'll receive the fall schedule, which looks like the one on the, on the screen. It's by day. It's, we call it the chart schedule. The schedule has everything you need. It has the dates, the title of the workshop, the time, the location, as well as the Zoom links, the meeting IDs, and the passwords to join the Zoom meetings. Please do not, we ask that you don't share this information with anyone as it's a program just for OLLI members, but also we wanna limit the risk of potential workshop interruptions. So keep this schedule somewhere that you know you're gonna find it. Save this schedule, you'll need it for the entire semester. Um, it includes all the, all the Zoom workshops and the links, but not, and, and not just the ones that you've registered for, all of the Zoom workshops. You, question? No question, is that on email? We will, that's what I was about to say. We're going to, we're going to be emailing it to you tomorrow, okay? So keep the email. You can bookmark it however you save it so that you can access it throughout the semester because we, we won't send it out every week. But the, the, the links in the schedule, if, I don't know if you can see it up there, but the title of the workshop, if it's a Zoom workshop, will have a hyperlink, meaning it's blue underneath. That's what you're gonna click on to join the Zoom workshop. They're clickable. Um, so be sure, be sure to save it. The schedule is color-coded. For those of you who are new, the blue is Zoom workshops, and you'll see it on the schedule, but just as a refresher, the pink are in-person workshops and the yellow are hybrid workshops. So keep that in mind when you're looking at the schedule. Um, the links, the meeting ID and the passwords do not change each week. So it's the, the, the links will be active throughout the entire semester. We encourage you to try other Zoom workshops. Uh, They're open to anybody that's a member to try them, even if you didn't register for them. If you wanna try something new, if you have some free time, if you wanna just jump in at one of the workshops, feel free. This way you can try something new. And if you don't like it, don't go back. They're not offended. <laughs> but you might find a workshop that, that you enjoy that you might not have thought of when you, you know, did your registration. Um, uh, when, you, when you join the Zoom workshops, it is open to anybody that is a member, but this is only this is only for Zoom workshops. In-person workshops are only for the people that have registered. Um, so you cannot decide that you want to join Bob Stone's watercolor workshop just because you're on campus. There are room capacities and space constraints, so we we do stick to the people that registered for the workshop. Um, as far as cancellation, I think Brianne had mentioned cancel. Did you mention cancellations? A little bit. On the, on the main OLLI website, we have a cancellation document. So we encourage you to look at that every day before you come to campus. It has dates that workshops are not in session that have been canceled or changes in the room location. So please, I encourage you to check that document. It's on the homepage of our website. Karen, do you have a question? Yeah, I just wanted to mention that if you decide to you have time and you want to try a new Zoom workshop and you decide you're going to continue to, to visit that class, it's helpful to send your email address to the workshop leader so that you'll be included on any um, emails that they send out during the semester. That's a good point, Karen. I'm going to repeat it because of the, the Zoom 
participants at home can't hear on that microphone, just so you know. Um, for those of you at home, what Karen, the curriculum chair, had mentioned is if you are considering joining a Zoom workshop and you want to continue to, to, to join that workshop each week, it may be helpful to the workshop leader to send them an email and let them know that you'll be joining that ongoing because sometimes they send out information to their class roster. They might want you to read something or what have you. That way they have you and you'll be getting their communication. Okay, so on to Wi-Fi and technology. What was that? Yeah, go ahead. We'll just do the last one. We're gonna to try to hold questions for the end, but go ahead. If you try and get into the Zoom workshop and a week doesn't know what you do. Good question. She asked if, if you're trying to join the Zoom workshop and the link doesn't work, what do you do? First of all, make sure you're joining it on the right day and time. Believe it or not, it's happened. It's a holiday and people are trying to join and the workshop isn't in session. Check the cancellation document first. And if you're really having trouble, then email us at spdolly at stonybrook.edu and we'll bring it up again. But that's the way you get quick assistance. You just email that um, that email address and we will respond. Brianne said 15 minutes, between 15 and 30, min 30 minutes, um, and you'll get the help you need. So speaking of Zoom workshops, um, if you plan to take any workshops while you're on campus from your device, meaning your laptop, your iPad, we encourage you to connect to Stony Brook's free Wi-Fi. This way you'll avoid uh, over data overages and poor connections. And in order to connect, you will need your net ID and password. So in your welcome packets, you have that information. So keep that somewhere that you can access it at a later date, put it in your phones, because if you need it on campus and your password and net ID are at home, you won't be able to join the Wi-Fi here. A lot of the buildings don't work. Uh, it's, it's a bad signal. In, in some of the buildings. So we really want you to try to join uh, the Wi-Fi on campus so that you have service. David, our Ali student assistant, who's sitting in the back. David, if you wanna stand up. He has a sign up sheet. So if you're interested in doing a one-on-one -on -one tech tutoring where he can get you set up on your Wi-Fi, he will set up some appointments um, after the orientation is over. So if you're interested in trying to connect your Wi-Fi rather than the first day of workshops and you're here already, he's going to set up some one-on-one -on -one workshops. Um, campus tours. So if for those of you who have not been on campus before, uh, we are offering campus tours on a, um, with your friends or a small group. Ama, if you wanna stand up. Ama's our Ali student assistant. She has a sign-up sheet and she will be scheduling tours uh, if you're interested in seeing some of the places on campus. Uh, so just see her late, see her at the end of the orientation. She's gonna, when you do the tour, she'll show you places where Ollie workshops are held, the best spots to park, our favorite part of campus, which is the bookstore where you can get tons of cool Stony Brook merchandise, shirts, hats, and more. That's the Wi-Fi and the campus tour. ID cards. So Stony, Brook's, Stony Brook University's official form of identification is the Stony Brook ID card, which looks similar to the one on the screen and Wolfie, our mascot, <laughs> although it won't be Wolfie on, the, on, on your, it'll be your picture. <laughs> um, so if you want access to the university library, parking in the administration parking garage, uh, using your Wolfie wallet and your Stony Brook ID will all be included with this ID card, which costs $25, but you only need to purchase it once. If you already have an Ali ID card, this is not for the new members, but if you're a current member, um, if you already have an Ali ID card, you shouldn't need another one. Um, you can get these, these ID cards starting the first day of workshops, which is September 5th, Tuesday, in the student union. A student union and we have maps should be in your packet of where the student union is. More information on the ID cards are found in your welcome packet. 
biggest question, where do you park? Biggest, biggest question we get all semester, where do I park, parking questions. The good news is that Ali has many options for parking on campus now. We have nine metered lots, 400 available spaces, and more affordable garage access. So there are four options. We have the Ali hang tags, option number one. We have the Ali hang tag. It's $50 per semester, 100 per year. And this, this is a hang tag, which looks like that pink and yellow kind of hang tag you, which you hang in your rear view mirror when you're parking on campus. And when you hang this on your rear view mirror, this will give you access to the metered lots that are listed in your parking, uh, the parking document in your, in your welcome packet. So there's nine metered lots that Ollie members can park in and they're identified on that, on that, um, on that map. Uh, you will not have to pay the meter. So don't park in that parking lot, pay the meter when you have the hang tag because you'll be paying twice. Did you have a question on that? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, what if you have a handicap ticket? I'm going to get to the handicaps. Yes, about handicaps. I'm going to get to that. I'm going to get to that. Okay. Yeah. No. We're going to try to hold all, all parking. There's a lot of parking questions. So we're going to hold it to the end just so we get through. Um, option number two is the administration parking garage, which some of you may have parked in when you enter main campus. It's to the left of you, it's across from the Wong Center. Um, that is very convenient, and we now secure at a lower rate. The rate is $22.72 per month, but you do need an ID card to park there. But it's very convenient to the Social Behavioral Sciences building. It's right, right adjacent to it. So a lot of the workshops are in that building, but it's your choice whether you want to get a hang tag or park in the garage. Number three is if you're really not going to be on campus too often, um, you might be Zooming most of the time and come, come, come to campus you know, once or twice. Uh, you can pay the meters, two fifty per hour, and you just pay the meter wherever you're parking. Option number four is designated spaces for persons with disabilities. If any Ollie member has a valid disabled parking permit, which is issued through your town, county, or state, you can park in any of those designated spaces on campus, except for the parking garage. <laughs> except for the parking garage. Uh, but more information about parking is in the parking documents in your welcome packet, and you can also visit the OLLI website parking page. And on the parking page, we have um, we have maps and campus maps and the OLLI parking lot maps. So really check out the website and make sure you look in your welcome packet for all the information you need. That wraps it up for me. Now we're going to go to questions, and I'm going to turn it back over to Brienne because she has all the answers. <laughs> all right, so so a lot of hands, so we just have to be mindful that there are folks at home. So while we're giving the microphones out to the folks who answer the questions in the room, it's so that everyone here can hear them better. I'm going to repeat the question because the folks at home on Zoom can only hear me through this little microphone right here. So David is our grad student assistant. He has a microphone. We're going to go around. So if you have a question, we're going to start out on this side of the room. Go ahead and ask, and I will repeat the question here. Okay. Uh, I just have two quick questions. One, one's a comment. For those people who are new, uh, Liz did mention that it is $50 for each semester to park in the uh, lot at a high tag or $100 for the year. The one thing that I think that sometimes people get confused about, if you get the $100, it also covers the summer. Yeah, so to reiterate what Bunny just said, if you purchase a hang tag, it's $50 per semester. If you're taking a term membership, that is your best option. However, if you do purchase the annual parking hang tag, which is $100, it encompasses the parking for your entire annual OLLI membership. At three, uh, the membership is $325, but your parking is $100, and it covers fall, spring, and the summer semester. Okay, and one other thing. I don't know when Liz just mentioned that it was expanded parking. 
Are there new blocks that are available to our members, or are, is it just that there are more spaces within the four minute blocks that is always parked in? Yeah, so Bunny was asking about the expanded parking. So um, in years past, we had only had about 300-ish spaces. We've worked with the parking department. We now have over 400 spaces. There are nine designated lots that you can park in. And within those lots, there are now more metered spaces. So we have nine lots. You'll notice on your parking map, there are little orange blocks next to um, where all the map, I'm sorry, on the map where you can park. They designate the lots. So in those lots, there are a total of 400 spaces that you can park in. As long as there is a number on the space and you are in the designated lot with your hang tag posted clearly in the rear view, you will not get a ticket. So there, what you're saying is that there aren't any new lots. There's just more spaces within the previous lot. Correct. So there are no new lots. There are more spaces within the nine lots that we have. Okay, thank you. All right. Uh, next question, hand up, we have right here. Yep, David's right behind you with a microphone. Well, uh, I just went into the parking lot. I think I was sick today, so I that I have to get a valid, David. Yeah, so all of our folks who are here today are actually getting complimentary parking. Yay, free parking. Um, so on the way out, you're actually going to see our lovely office volunteer, Camille. So Camille, if you could stand up. Everybody, let's give Camille a round of applause. Camille volunteers in our office, everyone. She's uh, she's just as, as much a part of this team as anybody else. So Camille has those parking stickers on your way out. If you parked in the garage and you got a little stick, a white piece of paper, uh, you see Camille on the way out, she'll give you a sticker, you hand it to the man in the booth and you don't have to pay a dime. All right, now next question. Right here, uh, right here in the front I have from this one. Okay. Um, Yes, so the question was, if you're in a designated lot, does the spot have to have a number? Yes, because the spots that don't have numbers are reserved for faculty, staff, and other uh, premier parking assets on the campus. So you must park in a numbered space within the lot and have your hang tag displayed. Um, how much time to do a lot before you have to go to a workshop to make sure you can get into a spot? That's a great question. How much time should you allot before you come to a workshop? So here's my recommendation, and I only say this because I've worked here, so don't take it from me. Um, I park in the garage because I know that there's always a space for me because they don't oversubscribe the garage. There are some drawbacks to the garage. Like with anything, there is no elevator in the garage. So if you end up parking on the second or third tier, if you need to, you'd have to walk down the ramps, right? So that's my preference is to park in the garage. I pay the fee the same like you guys do. If you're parking with your hang tag, it's a crapshoot because you're dealing with the same parking that the students are dealing with, that the faculty is dealing with, that the staff, that the visitors, we're all here. And truthfully, one of the pain points here at Stony Brook, which we you know, hope will get better over time is parking. And so there is a half hour designated before every workshop. So you'll notice that the workshops start at 8.30 and they run until 9.45. And then the next workshop doesn't start until 10.15. So my recommendation is that get here early, um, parking anytime after 9 a.m. Anytime between 9 a.m. and 12 p.m. is a little fuzzy because that's when most people are here on the campus. If you're here at eight o'clock, you'll have no issues getting a parking space because nobody's up at that hour. Okay. Um, if you're here after three o'clock, there are not many issues with parking. It's that main time. You'll notice you'll start to learn the trends. Not a lot of people here on Mondays, not a lot of people here on Fridays, but Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, you definitely want to leave yourself some time. So my recommendation is to get here as early as possible. But a good thing is giving yourself about a half hour to park, get to the campus, get a cup of coffee, sit down in your workshop. The rooms are always open. We try and make it as hospitable as possible. And there's always snacks around too. So <laughs> definitely come early. If you put a hang set and you'd rather park in the garage now, can you turn it back in and just if you bought a hang tag, can you get refunded and purchase the garage pass? That's a great question. Although Liz said I had all the answers, I don't. I would refer you to the parking department because they do have their own policies. Um, so we can find out some more about if you want to return that hang tag. 
Uh, no problem. Next question, uh, right next to you. Yes. Uh, how? What is the best way to find out if in per, an in-person class is canceled? Okay. All right. The question was, what is the best way to find out an in-person workshop was canceled due to weather? The cancellation document. So as Liz mentioned, as I may or may not have mentioned, I can't remember, the cancellation document is going to be linked on the schedule, the chart schedule that we send you. It's in the header. It's also the first thing you see when you come to our homepage. Check that document every day. You're putting on your shoes, you're getting your keys. Next step before you head out the door, look at that document on your phone or on the computer because if for some reason it's raining really bad, you got to take into consideration some of our workshop leaders are coming from Queens. They're coming from New York City, Manhattan. We have folks coming from the East End all over Long Island. And so if the weather is not as beautiful as it is today, they may personally choose to cancel their workshop. And so um, that's all on an individual need to know basis. We try and get it up there as soon as possible. Um, we do not send out emails every single time a workshop is canceled. We just can't manage the capacity because there are upwards of 15 workshops a day. You'd be getting so many emails, you'd be blocking us left and right. So we use the cancellation document. It's a live document. If I were to make an update on it right now, you could actually see me type in. So um, it's always being up to date and it's noted on there the last time that it was updated. So if you're on the site at 8.32 and it says the last update was made at 8.30, you know that you're seeing this two minutes after it was posted. Uh, next question right behind you with the mic. Um, my question is regarding phone books and mail. In July, we had a rather confusing directory on signing up for phone book email. Is it necessary? And if so, how do we get that downloaded onto our phone email? Because we need to know where it is. Yeah. Like the sign the phone. Great, great question. Stony Brook email. Is it confusing? Yes. Do I still understand it? No. Um, what that means is that it, the bigger picture here, so you have the solar system. Solar system encompasses all of Stony Brook. So in your welcome packets, if you're brand new, you're going to see your SBU ID number. That is the number that's printed on your card. That is the number that's going to help you when you're establishing all of your IDs. You also have your net ID, which essentially your net ID is the key to get into set up your Stony Brook email. If your head is spinning, don't worry. Mine's been spinning for four years. Thankfully, we have a wonderful team of students who could explain this in their sleep. And David has a sign-up sheet where he does one-on-one -on -one tech tutorials. You come into the office for about, he could do it in about 10 minutes, get you set up, have all your logins, you write them down, get your email set up. And the purpose of having your Stony Brook email it's just a premier email service, meaning that you get an at stonybrook.edu email. So you're official. You're part of the Stony Brook fam. You guys get your information. You can use it to log into the library database. You can use it when you're going into the Google suite. So you get a lot of programs for free. You can use Google Slides, Google Power, um, Google Sheets, Google Docs, any of those things. Um, and there's also access to other downloadable programs as well. And you need to know all that information to get connected to the Wi-Fi. So that are those are some of the bigger reasons why you need all of this. So again, David's in the back. If you have questions, we'll sign you up for a tech tutorial next week. You stop into the office for five, anywhere from five to 15 minutes. You'll have everything set up and be on your way. Uh, next question is right behind you, Charlotte, if you want to hand over the mic. The card that I have yes. is 10 years old. Okay. Will I be able to uh, do all these other things that you say? Yeah, so the question is, my ID card is 10 years old. There's an expiration date on the card. Oh, so, no. So if you, okay, so it's, it's that, uh, I'm going to call it antique. We're going to say that that antique, um, that there's an ID card right here. If you don't have an expiration date, that's fine, but if you do, you can completely ignore it. So students get new ID cards with new expiration dates. The university has extended us the courtesy of not charging members $25 every year. You get your card and you keep it. Um, so you can ignore the date. What happens is in our computer system, we actually update you on the back end. So you're up to date in the system, but we just don't print out a new card for you. So once you have a card, keep it, it's for life. Uh, next question. 
Right. Uh, um, can you hand, do you have a mic? I, I have. Oh, okay. 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 So the question was, can I use Stony Brook University buses to get from building to building? To get to from the lots to the lots. So you're going to have to visit the Stony Brook parking website to get the bus schedule and find out where the stops are. You are eligible to jump on a Stony Brook bus. No one has ever turned us away. Um, so by all means, feel free to jump on. You do need your ID card to get on the bus. Uh, we have a question in the back, Bob Merman, and then we're going to go right here in the front. I've been a member since 12. I really do not remember if I had a Stony Brook email or not. I've used my home email. Is there a way of checking that to see if I have it before I sign up to get one? Um, you're going to sign up with David. So David will help you with that. Um, everybody gets assigned a Stony Brook email. So you have your NetID and password. You are automatically given a Stony Brook email address, and you can utilize it. So David will help you out setting that up. Uh, could we bring the mic up here as well? Thank you. I have a question about the hand pad for the administrative parking garage. Yes. Um, from from the, uh, the page here, I understand that it has to be obtained in person. I can't obtain that online. That is correct. And so we were doing the online. If you got your parking, it, the hang tag, we're talking about two different things. Yeah. So there's the parking hang tag, which lets you park in the lots. Those were available online from August 1st to August 15th. Now that that date has passed, we have to wait until September 5th to visit the parking department. Um, so you can go to the Stony Brook Union, the second floor. If you're using the hang tag, you can get that there. They'll hand it to you on site. If you were going to park in the administrative parking garage, you have to pay on site and you use your ID card. So you have to get your ID card as well. That ID card, you actually swipe into a pad. So when you drive up to the, the booth, there's a gray box and you wave your ID card and then the magic gate opens and lets you right in. Same thing on the way out. So those are the two different options, both of which are available starting on Tuesday, September 5th when the office opens at 8 a.m. Oh, All right, no problem. Liz, right, we have a question right here behind you. Hi. Hi. Um, Three questions. Three, okay. This is forever. You That's forever. Expires on. You can completely ignore the expiration. Ignore the expiration. Thank That's you. Correct. Second, the parking garage, uh, the parking office, parking department. Where is it located? It's located in the student union on the second floor. So that's not the SAC building. It's not the SAC uh, building, it's the student okay. union. And so you can sign up with Ama to get a tour. She'll walk you over there next week. Student union. Yeah, and next question? Uh, yes, okay. Uh, never mind, that's the new ID card. That's been eliminated by one of my other questions. I guess that's it. All right, great. Any other questions here in the room today? I'm going to see if we have any questions coming in on Zoom as well. Oh, yeah, thank you. Go ahead, here uh, in the room, and then we'll get to Zoom. Quick question. Uh, some of the data that we've received says that you can get your your parking pass for the administrative parking garage tomorrow uh, on the 3rd. So the part, the administrative garage parking, you'll have to, everything for parking now has to wait until Tuesday, September 5th. The good news is if you come to the campus on Tuesday, park in the garage, get the ticket. When you go to the administrative garage and they set, I'm sorry, when you go to the parking department and they set you up, you're going to get a validation. So you don't have to pay that ticket and you'll be able to leave. So park in the garage on Tuesday. When you get all your parking set up, you can walk over and you won't have to worry about it moving forward. Thank you. No problem. We have a couple of questions online. I didn't receive my orientation package in the mail and I have the metered hang tag, which lots can I use? Orientation packets, if you're not here today in person are being mailed out, you should have them in the next couple of days. Guys, if we could just keep the feedback in the room low, otherwise. Sorry. Can you keep the noise down because the people that's on Zoom can't hear it, the room, so it's just going to be a few moments. So the orientation package, you'll get it in the mail. If you don't receive it by the time the semester starts on Tuesday, feel free to pop into the office and we can give you another one. Everybody here today should have a copy of their welcome packet. Um, the lots are noted on the parking document, which can be found on the website as well as in your um, packet. 
Uh, the next question is, can I use my ID tag to park in the garage instead of in the metered lots? There are two different ways to park. You have to either have the admin card to get into the garage or your hang tag. Um, and we have someone here who would like to make an appointment with David. Um, so I'll go ahead and share that information with him now. Is there any other questions here in the room today? Go ahead, right here. We have a mic behind you. Yes. Um, I'm sorry. Okay. Um, yeah, this, I, I, I may have missed what David said, and I apologize if that's the case. But I might be on campus a number of times between the first and the fifth working at the welcome tables. So, do I need to validate it from the college? No, so the welcome tables don't start until September 5th because that's when the semester starts. There's nothing happening on campus from the first to the fifth. Workshops and events don't start until the fifth on Tuesday. Okay, so then I wouldn't I wouldn't bother to go nope. and get to the September class or whatever. No, that's fine. That Thank you. All right, we have one last question here in the front. Okay. It says on this uh, form that um, the campus uh, card office is open on Monday, Wednesday, and Thursday. However, the gift is Tuesday. So it's going to be open. You can disregard that the, the office is open on Tuesday. Oh, okay. It's open Monday through Friday. We'll get that corrected. Oh. Tuesday, it's open from 8 30 to 8 30. That's okay. All right. So, with that, I want to thank everyone here today for joining us for new member orientation. Um, please be sure that you remember that we start on Tuesday, September 5th. There is no workshops on Monday. We are closed for the holiday. Um, and be sure that if you would like to schedule a tour or any tech help that you see Amma and David on the way out, again, please grab some refreshments. And thank you so much for joining us today at Ali at SPU's new member orientation.